Appreciate that. So my name is Greg Steger. I'm the security architect for DB2. Uh, I've been with IBM um, in DB2 development for just about 20 years now. Most of that time has been in security, a little bit of time in monitoring, a little bit of time in blue, um, but mostly in security. So today we're going to talk about security enhanced DB2 with security enhanced Linux. So that's SE Linux. Um, we're going to find out what is it, okay? You know, why would you want to use it? What benefit does it provide? How to enable its use with DB2? Um, how to customize its use for you? Something you're really going to have to do. And then troubleshoot issues that I can guarantee that you'll have. <laughs> okay? Unfortunately. Not with DB2, with SE Linux. Um, but there's ways of, of easily getting around them. So we're going to talk about that. So, the what and why of SE Linux. So what is it? There's three main properties, okay? It is a label-based mandatory access control system enforced by the Linux kernel, okay? It's used to harden a server, and it really has two primary focuses that have kind of emerged from the technology. One is to limit the damage that can be done if someone hacks into a network-facing service, so like DB2, like a web server, an FTP server, something like that. Someone hacks into it. What can they do? They can't spread laterally to other machines. They can't affect other services on the system. That's its primary focus. You can also use it to prevent insiders from accessing data. So limiting what other users on that system might be able to do, blocking their usage just to authorized users bit of background on it. It was originally developed by the NSA and added to open source Linux in the year 2000. Uh, so it's been around quite a while, but it's very popular. Okay, so it's not like a stagnant technology that's 20 years old. If you look at the RHEL 8 beta release notes, I, I know it's out now, but when I put the slides together, that was the state of things. There was, it was mentioned 53 times. Okay, so this is something probably gaining increased usage, not sort of a decreased usage. Um, so it's not old stagnant technology. Today we can't cover everything to do with SE Linux in one hour. Okay, it's just enough to make you dangerous. It, it's just, it's a huge topic. Uh, we could spend the whole day session going over everything, but it's to get you that fundamental idea of what it is and, and how you can uh, look at using it. So I mentioned three properties, and we're going to go through each of those. So the first is to understand what is mandatory access control. And to do that, it helps to understand what is discretionary access control, because this is what most people are familiar with. If you look at your Unix file permissions, okay, as the owner of the file, you get to change what the file permissions are. You can say, oh, I'm going to let everybody read my database files or my password file. Okay, you get that choice. Mandatory access control says there's a security administrator on the system who defines a policy of what everything can, uh, everything that can happen on that system. So even though you've granted read access to the world, there is an overarching policy that says no, not everybody can read this. And you as a user cannot control that, okay? Only the system administrator defines that and can control that, okay? So that's the difference between discretionary and mandatory access control. So if we look at that in DB2, just to, you know, level set and kind of familiarize ourselves with what that meant, um, you know, if a sec atom came along and says, grant select uh, on T1 to a user, that's sort of Mac-ish. It's not exactly a, a mandatory access control, but they can't do anything with that, right? Whereas if I do that same grant and I give the with grant option, it now means that user can go out and grant to other people. So based on their discretion, they can allow others to see that table, right? So that's very discretionary. In DB2, we have two very specific mandatory access control features, and that is LBAC and RCAC. Each of those require the security administrator alone to go in and define what the policies are and, and who can access the table. So for example, the table owner said, well, I'm going to grant select to public, okay? But RCAC comes in on top of that and says, no, no, the security administrator has said, unless you belong to this role, you can't see any rows at all. So, so that's a, an example of, of mandatory access control. 
The next property of SE Linux is that it is enforced by the Linux kernel. So this isn't sort of some add-on technology on top of it that can, you know, likely a way to bypass it type of thing. It, it's deep in the kernel. It uses something called Linux security modules to enforce that. So these are points in the Linux kernel that it calls out that sort of plug-in or hooks can, can be put in there and, and various other products do this to say, is there any additional checks I want to do? So there's some other examples, AppArmor, Smack, Tomio, or just some other products that make use of those LSMs. Um, but SE Linux is by far sort of the, the, biggest, um, the biggest users of it. In terms of the, the discretionary access control, those fire first. So if you're reading a file, you still need file permissions. It's not a replacement. The, the kernel checks those first, and then it checks the SE Linux policies on top of that. So the last property was it's a label-based access control system. Everything in the kernel, or sorry, everything on the system gets a label. It's not just files. Users get a label. Running processes get a label. Ports get a label. File systems get a label. There's a lot of different things get labels, okay? And these rules or policies define how a process interacts with resources based on their label, okay? So that's the first thing, just remember, we're a label-based system, and then we're going to talk about how type enforcement comes into it. So within a label, this is an example of a label here, there are four portions. There's a user, a role, a type, and MLS MCS. And we're going to go through each of the definition of those in a second. This is just an example you can see here, listing out in blue what an actual label is. So SE Linux has kind of taken over the dash capital Z option for most command line uh, utilities to say, like, show me the SE Linux information. So LS, PS, lots of others have a, a dash capital Z, um, and it's going to spit out that information. So here we see the password file, Etsy password, has a password file type, system, user, object, role, um, etc. And a running process, the SSH daemon here, uh, similar attributes. Okay, everything has a label. So that's the number one thing to keep in mind. It's a label-based system. So each of those components now, what are they? So the first thing is a user. This is not an individual user. It's not gstager. It's more of a user group, a type of user. So on, on a Red Hat system, there's eight defined users here that I'm showing. Um, typically, there, there's also sometimes a DB Atom user. Uh, sorry, no, it's a DB Atom role. Um, there's mappings that define when you log in, what user do you get as part of your label? Okay, typically it's an unconfined user, and we'll talk about in a few slides why that is. But you can change it, so you can say, well, this is a sysatom user, this is a staff user, that sort of thing. If this is not heavily customized, so typically the defaults are generally good for most people. Um, similarly with roles, they don't change a lot. So users define what roles you can get, okay? So that's the main grouping is you're going to become a user, type that user is going to act, allow you to get access to certain roles. These roles are going to allow you to access certain types, and the type is sort of the heart of SE Linux. You can only have one role at a time. There's commands that if you have access to more than one role based on your user type, you can switch. But by default, you're going to get one of these roles when you, when you log in. They're also not heavily customized. Um, typically, the default ones are good enough in most scenarios. You will, by default, have the unconfined role when you log in. But that can be changed. This is a bit out of an order because I want to get this one out of the way before we talk a lot about types. So MLS MCS is multi-level security and multi-category security. So the multi-level is something like confidential, secret, top secret, that type of thing on a, a hierarchy. It's also called sensitivities. The multi-category is like a category or a compartment. So you can think of something being as top secret project Treadstone. Right, that the Treadstone is the category, right? So you can't have access to some documents unless you have access to that category as well. 
these, the, the categories are used for containers. We're not going to really get into uh, containers. This is more about strictly just sort of an on-prem scenario. And this is kind of the last we're going to talk about MLS and MCS. We could spend several hours just on this topic alone and we, we don't want to do that. We want to get the whole overview. So just remember, you'll see these sensitivity and category levels as, as part of a label. So we get to the heart of the system, which is types. Okay, SE Linux is primarily a type enforcement system. So a process has a type, but we call it its domain. So when you hear that the slides reference a domain or you hear me talk about domain, that is the type portion of the label for a running process. The majority of rules in Linux fall into two categories. Some of them are allow rules that says a process, when it's running in this type, with this type, it is allowed to access these resources in this way. Okay? So DB2, when the, the server is running in the DB2 domain type, it's going to be allowed to read from our data files, as an example. Okay? The other type of rule is transition rules. This is where a domain, when you're running your shell, for example, and you run DB2 start, I've created a rule that says you're going to transition from your domain into the DB2 D domain, into the, the daemon domain for DB2, okay? So there's these transition rules that allow you as a process to go from one domain to the other. So there's, there's two primary rules, is, is allow rules and transition rules. There's other types, but this is sort of what 99% uh, of SE Linux is made up of. So just as, as an example of that, so we had the password file and the SSH daemon here. Um, there will be a rule that says the SSH daemon T type is allowed to read the password file type. So really it's any process running in that domain. So the SSH D underscore T domain, but there will also be rules that pretty much make sure that only the SSH daemon ever gets into that domain, right? Your shell will never be running in that domain or be able to get there. But there will be rules that say this domain is allowed to read that file. And then there'll be transition rules that say, okay, when a user logs in, an SSHD runs the login tool to transition into the unconfined domain because that's what we want the user's shell to run as. So there's a transition rule it says when one runs the other executable, we can transition. So SE Linux is unfortunately very complicated. These are um, some stats that you can get about just the number of different objects in the system. You can see under the, the allow here, there's 107,000 allow rules saying this is allowed to do this. So it's too much for anybody to go in and really perfectly understand. Um, but, you know, the, these are all part of open source systems. People have looked at it, helped develop it um, to keep systems secure. So uh, those aren't all for DB2. There's only a few for DB2. This is just what comes on. Um, this was a, a RHEL 7 system, okay, out of the box. Uh, you can see we have eight users, 14 different roles. Um, there'll be transitions. Um, somewhere on here. Uh, there's different types of transitions, but the, uh, where's the one we want? I think it's the, it's the type transition there. So 18,000 of them is the, uh, the number of those transitions from one domain to another. Okay, so there's a lot to get your head around, but unless you're going to go in and, and deeply into this, you, you don't need to know all of it. So on RHEL, there is something called a targeted policy. So a default set of rules that apply, and they ship with lots of information for open source systems, um, not DB2, that's what we're going to be talking about later, how to do that, but they have a, a targeted policy. And what that was was when, when SE Linux was originally developed, they tried to 100% lock down the system. And basically, Anybody who tried to do anything with SE Linux turned on was just fail, 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 fail. You did LS, fail. Because it just was, it was too confining. So uh, things have kind of backed off, and now there are only select systems that have SE Linux applied to them. 
and it, they're targeted, they're targeted systems. Hey, we want these ones protected. And those are basically network facing services, okay? So database services, FTP servers, web servers, et cetera, et cetera. Anything that is gonna open a network port that you might get hacked in is gonna have an SE Linux apply, uh, policy applied to it. Everybody else runs unconfined. And what that means is it's almost like SE Linux is not being enforced, okay? It, it is, but there's just lots of policies that says when you're in unconfined, you can do whatever you want, okay? That you can go and you can read any file. I mean, if you have the original file permissions. So that was their compromise, I think, in the SE Linux world of saying, let's get the most important stuff, but let's not affect everybody doing their day job in the average system. Because this is on and enforcing by default in RHEL 7 and RHEL 8 systems. So you may even have it on and running and you're not even aware of it, right? And that's because they've allowed this to happen. Let's, let's get the important stuff, leave the other stuff alone. So I, it seems to me like a reasonable compromise. You can change it. You can go in and modify it so that when users log in, their default policy is not unconfined. You can put them into staff or user or guest or stuff like that, and then additional rules kind of apply to it. So if you really need it in your environment, you can lock things down further, right? But by default, for most people, it's not as necessary. So this is kind of a visualization using DB2 of, of what I've just been saying, okay? So the, the most outer box is the server. So we're talking about, we have the database running there. We want to allow remote users to come in. We've opened a network port, but if for some reason they can take advantage of a vulnerability, hack into DB2 somehow, they can't get out, okay? They're confined in some manner. That's what our goal is. Don't let DB2 run unconfined, okay? By default, when you just go and install, without the policies that we're gonna talk about, you install DB2, it is running unconfined, okay? Because there is no policy for it and then it would be wide open. So we're trying to box it in is the way I phrase it, okay? So example here, unconfined, users that get the unconfined role can access everything with DB2. Users that get the DB Atom role can access everything with DB2. A regular user is, is blocked, can't access DB2 files, okay? So this is sort of those two main goals we talked about for SE Linux, prevent damage for somebody getting in that they can't get too far out, and prevent users that aren't authorized from getting at the database. Now what this, you know, if some remote user is malicious and gets in, SE Linux is not going to do anything to stop them from like running SQL or accessing database files, okay? Because that is a normal thing for DB2 to do. So the rules are there, it says, yeah, DB2, it can read the container files, it can read the log files, et cetera, right? Because that's what we do. So it's not stopping that. It's more about stopping, um, moving sideways, you know, getting out to other systems, that sort of thing. Okay, how do you know if SE Linux is on? You wanna go home and check, am I running it? Is it turned on or not? There's an SE status command that will print things out, information about the status of SE Linux. Okay, the most important one is the first one, is it enabled or not, okay? Disabled means it's off. Next thing is the enforcing mode. Uh, current mode enforcing. This means yes, it is enforcing. There's a way in SE Linux to say permissive, which means check the rules, audit them, but allow it to happen. Okay, and, uh, th we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. Um, but those are the two primary things you have to look at to see if, if SE Linux is on on your system. If it's not, and you want to turn it on, great. So you change a config file, you add the lines SE Linux equals enforcing, and you reboot. Be cautious though, as this will relabel your entire file system. If it was not on before, every file has uh, a default rule. Often it's just based on the directory it's in, but there's sort of rules for every file in the, in the system. And SE Linux is gonna to go to every single file and touch it and add an attribute to it, giving it its label, okay? So this might take a long time if you have, right, a, a large number of files. So, so just be careful, just don't go to a production system and type this and turn it on and reboot and um, that wouldn't be good.
Yes. Um, so it is definitely installed on other distributions. It's not a Red Hat specific thing. Um, I don't know if it's on and enforcing in other distributions. I have a feeling um, for SLES it is, but I can't confirm that. But certainly the SE status command is an SE Linux command. It's not a Red Hat command. And so it's going to tell you um, whether it is. Yeah. Um, if SE Linux was disabled, you might want to start in permissive mode just to, it'll do the relabeling just to make sure there's no problems when you start back up and that uh, you don't get any unexpected errors on the system, right? Deal with those first while it's in permissive mode versus in enforcing mode. Um, and that's not a DB2 thing, that's just a general system level thing. So, okay, so a bit more on permissive versus enforcing. So enforcing is the rules are audited plus enforced. Permissive, again, is they are audited so you can figure out what is going wrong, but things will not get an error, okay? So you're going to go to your logs, the audit logs, and see what failed and fix it, but your system is up and running. So it's really helpful when first deploying um, new policies, that sort of thing, that uh, you can, you know, test it out first. Okay, so that's the basics of what SE Linux is and why you might want to use it. So I'm just going to pause there for any questions um, about that section. So yes, I see one here. Tom, if the file system is labeled uh, from disk, for example, can you move that disk to another Linux? Can you move that? Okay, so the question was the uh, file system gets labeled. So it's in the X attribute of, uh, of a file system that it marks this. Can you move it to another file system? Like take the disk and plug it into another machine. Um, I honestly don't know the answer to that. I've never tried it. Uh, I'm trying to remember if in any reading it's come up. I think if the configuration was all the same, the same policies were applied, I would expect it to work. But if your policies are different, like uh, a, a different set of rules and stuff like that, that is, it's, you're going to get some weird behavior. But for example, the NFS file system, yep. which is read by server server. Right. So NFS is the question. So I have a slide about that, um, about the different file systems, which ones are supported. And, but the, just to answer it right now, for NFS, Red Hat recommends that all systems have to be running Red Hat. And that then it's supported, that they'll all get the, the right answer, essentially. So I think in that sense that as long as the same policy is applied everywhere, that there'll be a consistent view of that data. So the policy is, is loaded into the kernel at boot time. So we're going to talk a little bit about this. Uh, what you get um, for, the, for the DB2 stuff is, is basically source code, which you compile into these .pp files, these, these policy files, that are then loaded into the kernel. Okay? And so I think as long as that same policy is everywhere, the exact same one, if you start getting different ones with different definitions, like all bets are up. Correct. No, it's an X adder. So POSIX has a standard X adder, X A T T R, and it's part of that. Okay, so sample policies for DB2 um, to get up and running with SE Linux. If you went to our samples directory right now, you're going to find RHEL 4 and 5. <laughs> Rather out of date. Actually, we removed RHEL 4 because we we're too embarrassed by that, but uh, 5 is still there. <laughs> I'm not sure why, but anyways. Um, what I've come up with now is new policy files, 
for RHEL 7 available in our, our GitHub samples uh, directory. So I'm sure you've heard about it, something instead of in SQL lib samples, you can now go to GitHub and download our samples files. Okay, um, that's where we're putting all our new samples and uh, I have those there. So it allows us to do a bit more continuous delivery instead of you having to, to wait for new fix packs and stuff like that. It's easier to get samples updated. And I'm hoping it allows a little more, for this one specifically, community involvement. That if people aren't happy with that, can submit issues, can submit pull requests to fix things, uh, that sort of thing, right? Because it's, it's, it's out there. We're going to talk about that. I have a very specific slide on, on um, what that is. And one more slide. Uh, so the samples will be for 11.1 and 11.5. Uh, I haven't tried them on older releases yet. So of either DB2 or, say, <coughs> RHEL 6. Um, SE Linux has tended to evolve over time, and some of the things on one release don't always work on another. Um, so Red Hat is the focus that I've been working on. Haven't tried them on SLES yet, so. Uh, but this is, again, a community involvement thing. And if someone tries it, you know, open an issue to say, yes, it worked or something, and we can, you know, add a comment for other people to, uh, to know that that's happened. Um, RHEL 8, DB2 does not officially support it yet, so don't have those available. But shortly after, I expect uh, the ones I have now to still work for, for RHEL 8. Um, and I've only tested serial mode right now. So just haven't set up the test infrastructure sort of thing for DPF or pure scale. Uh, but, but I expect that to follow. I mean, the, the policies will work in all scenarios because it's, we're just defining what DB2 is allowed to do. It's allowed to do it. We just have to create that right policy, right? So, so it'll work. It just hasn't been fully tested yet. Um, just one thing to be aware of for these samples is that they are samples. And I expect to have sort of us to continue to refine them over time. And what I mean by that is the goal is to tighten that confinement, right? So instead of running unconfined, we're now putting a box around it. It's currently a, a pretty big <coughs> box. And I want to shrink it down, right? So that there's less things that if, if someone gets in could go wrong. So I expect over time we're going to be, you know, as we get feedback, as we get time to go in there and, and shrink things. So just sort of expect that. Um, yes, there's a question in the back. Uh, no, I, don't, I haven't tested TSA yet. But that'll basically be a rule saying we're allowed to work with you know, either opening ports or shared memory or that sort of thing. So I'm not sure if, if TSA supports SE Linux and running in uh, uh, an unconfined mode or not yet, so, yeah. Um, anything else? So this was your question now about support. Uh, it hasn't really been clear in the past, do we support SE Linux? We have policies, sample policies that kind of implied that we did, but what really officially did it mean? So uh, we got together to kind of clarify that. So the use of SE Linux is supported. The policies are samples and not directly supported. Okay, so that needs a bit of clarification. So if you turn on SE Linux and some rule fires because of the policy and it denies something and for some reason the system traps or has really bad behavior, well, that's what's supported. We shouldn't do that, right? DB2 has to be able to handle any error given to it and not go off and do something weird, right? If you went and changed the file permission outside of what DB2 should have, right? Well, you did something sort of unsupported in a sense that you, you shouldn't have changed the, the file permission for DB2 files. We didn't expect it, but we shouldn't behave in a totally unexpected way. We should give you a reasonable error back. Hey, we couldn't open this file. Okay, that's sort of the statement here. And another example is if you put a firewall on DB2, right? So you put a firewall in front of us and blocked all our ports and then said, I can't connect from my clients. It's not necessarily the engine's fault. There's a rule that's preventing something else from happening. That's sort of what's happening here is that these SE Linux policies are outside the database and confining it. What we're having with the samples is it's, it's working in our environment.
but there's a lot of reasons that they won't necessarily work directly for you and are going to need your customization. Okay? And I go through a whole bunch of examples of that in, in a few slides. Um, but we can't know everything. For example, you may have stored procedures, okay, written in C, running unfenced in the engine, that goes off and does something that our policy says, no, you're not allowed to do. We can't predict that, and we can't fix that for you. You're going to have to go to the policy to allow it, to understand what your application is doing and, and create something on top of it that allows that to run, okay? So th what we're the samples that I have are basically you install DB2 out of the box, you just create the sample database in the default directories, and that's going to work. Okay? You put your data outside of the default database directories, which you should be doing, and they're not going to be necessarily labeled correctly. Now I have some examples here to show you how to fix that, but that's the example of what we mean by the sample itself. We can't guarantee it's, it's going to run everywhere and that you're going to have to test it and apply it to your system. Okay, so don't open a support case saying, hey, this was blocked by SE Linux, what's going on? Okay, you likely, we're going to say, you're going to have to solve that yourself. If you think it's a problem with the default policy that everybody would benefit, open a GitHub issue on the samples, okay, so that I can see it and others can see it, and we'll look at it and, and consider adding rules to help protect it, right? Explain exactly what the situation is, show us the audit logs and, and why you're hitting it, we can help with that, but it's just not sort of a, um, an issue that we can come in and fix it. And I guess the other, other thing to just understand here is there's a concept of an SE Linux aware application, and that is an application who directly makes API calls inside its code to Linux to say, oh, I want to find out about SE Linux and, and make specific changes to things, DB2 does not do this. So this is just a set of rules on top of the current DB2, okay? So what do the samples consist of? So if you went um, on GitHub and took a look, what, what is it, what's there? So it's source code, right? So you can go and look at what the rules are and change them. Uh, if you need to. There are a few different things. There are file contexts, which define by default how files get labeled. There are interface files, they're sort of like header files that other SE Linux policies can make use of that you could build on top of. And the primary one is a type enforcement file. And that has all of the rules, right, all of the allow rules that DB2 is allowed to do this, allowed to do that built in. There's two sets of policy files. One is for uh, DB2, meaning the engine, the server, right? So if you're only running a server on the system, that's all you're going to need. There's one called DB2 app, which is if you also have applications on the system that want to access it. So you have non-administrators that are running the CLP or something like that. You have other applications that are on the same server locally that you want to access DB2, you can run that policy as well. But I, I expect in most cases, people will just need the, the primary DB2 set of policies. There is a script to compile all of this and run it. And then there's a script to label the instance owner's directory. Okay, so by default, when you install, uh, we have some steps here, the install directory, install directory will get labeled properly, but we want to control the instance owner's home directory because that's what gets us into the DB2 domain, uh, DB2D domain, and so we want to only apply that to individual instance owners that the uh, that root has controlled, okay, and not just have it on by default. So to make use of the policy, it doesn't matter if you've installed DB2 already or install DB2 after applying the policy. You run the db2.sh script. This will, will compile the policy and install it um, in Linux. If you install DB2 after running the script, you have to run this restore con uh, tool inside of SE Linux to relabel the um, opt IBM DB2 file system, okay, to restore the context of the files. If you have local applications, like I said, run db2 app, 
that script to, to install that policy. Um, and then you run the one the, uh, to label the instance owner's home directory. So you tell us who the instance owner is and where that directory is, and that'll go off and, and set all the proper labels on those files. And then, as we're going to talk in the next section, you're going to have non-default data directories. You need to label those as well. So inside the policy uh, are a number of different domains and have more than one so that we can tighten that box, right? Because DB2 has more than one process. It's not just the single server process that runs so that we can control what each can do. So there's a primary DB2D domain for the engine. Um, there's a DB2 admin domain. This is for all of our administrative tools. Um, so DB2 PD, DB2 trace, things like this. There's an FMP domain. Um, there's a DB2 domain, which is just for non-administrative tools, the CLP, that sort of thing. And there's a fault monitor domain. Then there's a bunch of file types, just so we can control who's accessing which type of file. So data files, dialog files, config files, shared, lib shared library files, and just a catch-all file type. Okay? And again, the reason for so many is just we can limit who can do what. Right? So user types, okay, the, the DB2 user um, type can't read data files, but it's going to need to be able to read config files. Right? So, again, it's just a matter of some complexity just to control who can do what. So the question was, um, will this be aware, something to, to do for external tables, right? So this would be a good example of we're not going to know where you're going to put all your data, right? So external tables are going to go and write to a file, if that directory doesn't have a type that the db2d domain can write to, it's going to get denied. So uh, we'll talk about that. It, it, well, yeah, it's very comparable to, to file permissions, right? If, the, if you haven't given the instance owner permission to write to that file, then the, it's going to be denied as well. Okay, so, so very much like that, but that's discretionary. So in this case, you're going to have to create a directory and you're going to label that directory with the DB2 data type. And then all the files under that will inherit that type. Okay, so yeah, no, it's a good question. Um, and there should be some examples here that will, I didn't put external files, but would, would help with that scenario. Does that mean that others cannot write to that file? So, uh, yes and no. So, because it's a new file type, that generally other domains won't have access to? Yes, except for the unconfined has access to all file types. So your default user just logging into the shell will still be able to come along and read that. And if they're just running some scripts or something on those files, we'll still be able to read it. So, so yes and no uh, is the answer for that. Um, by default, when you install these policies, uh, because I know, like I said, you're, you're likely going to run into problems, they are set to be permissive by default, okay? So this allows you to install them right away and test them in your environment. So what that means is everything else on your system is run enforcing if you're in the default mode, except for the DB2 policies, the ones that we've just installed. It gives you a chance to test them out, check the audit logs, see what's happening. Then when you're satisfied, there's a way here of removing that permissive attribute from the policy. Okay, so you would say, I see manage permissive dash D on the domains, uh, on the listed domains there, to remove that permissiveness. You could go back to the actual policy file and remove the line permissive from it and then recompile and it, it would accomplish the same thing. But you can also just run this tool. Okay, and then there's a way of checking, double checking which, which domains uh, are running permissive if you want to, you know, validate yourself that it's gone. Okay. But if someone ever came back and changed the policy file and re-ran it uh, and reinstalled it, it would be permissive again. So, so you might want to go and actually remove that from the, the policy file itself. Okay, this goes back to the question about the, the file system support. 
Um, so it's basically anything that has the POSIX X attribute um, ability to store, to support it, okay? Um, okay, now we're going to talk about customizing things for use, right? Where to put your data, how to label it. So example, we don't know install directory. The policy assumes it's an opt IBM DB2, you might put it somewhere else. Policy is not going to work, right? Where your database files are, transaction logs, backups, dialog can be configured. We don't know what your external routines are doing, authentication plugins, where your external tables are being written to, right? Things probably won't be labeled correctly. How do you deal with that? Okay, install directory. <coughs> SE Linux has a command that says, an equivalency command that says, hey, I know the rules for this directory, treat everything over here in the same manner. Okay, so you can give it opt IBM DB2 and say, wherever I've installed DB2, treat in the same manner. Okay, it's the dash E option here to the SE manage. So SE manage, F context is saying set the file context. Okay, so this is creating a rule inside um, the SE Linux policy manager to remember this, but then you have to relabel the file system after this. And not necessarily the whole, whole file system, I should say. Um, you can only do that one directory. So you come in, you say, hey, this is what the, the file system should have in this directory, and then RestoreCon uh, restores the context to what it should be, to what SE Linux thinks is the default. Um, you can add rules. So these aren't equivalency rules, this is just a direct rule for where is your data going, okay? So, or where is your diagnostic directory um, going to be if it's not in the default? So se manage f context dash a, so we're adding one. Uh, it's a file type, db2 data t is, is the type we want, and then what is going in the directory? So. Uh, it's sort of a regular expression type thing here. You put bracket slash dot star bracket question mark means that directory and everything inside of it. Okay, because typically you, you don't have a directory with mixed data and non-data sort of here's all your, your data files are here. Um, and then anything else you might be doing that I can't guess you're going to have to to change as well, right? If the external routines are um, off doing weird stuff, uh, you'll need to to change things to allow that, okay? So you can modify the direct policy that we supply. You can also create additional policies on top of it, right? To create just a small set of rule sets so that you're not changing the, the ones we have. And you can... Um, create just a separate one to, to, to distribute. And there's a tool, Audit to Allow, which we're going to go through example, which will help you create these additional rules based on failures. Okay, uh, so the last section is what to do when things go wrong. Um, typically, in the order of likelihood that you're going to see these, most things are going to be a labeling problem. So if you're getting errors, it's likely something hasn't been labeled right. Right? It's, it, you forgot to put the data type onto the directory and DB2 can't read the files, okay? It, it, it can be a policy problem. Um, like I said, a GitHub issue to, to help work through that. Uh, could be an application bug in DB2 or an SE Linux bug, really unlikely, or hopefully you'll never see it that you've been compromised and that's why you're seeing all these audit logs, someone's trying to do stuff they can't do, right? Um, but hopefully you'll never see those. So labeling problems, what do you do? So you go and you first look at the file that um, you're having a problem with. You know, LS on it, what's the current context? Sorry, what's the, the current label for the file? What does SE Linux think it should be labeled with? So match path con or this restore con option will tell you, hey, SE Linux thinks it should have been this. Maybe it got changed somehow, um, the, but this is what SE Linux thinks the default should be. If they're different, you need to investigate that and why. You can change it temporarily with changecon. It just says, go to this file and change it, okay? But there's cases where either running restorecon or relabeling, relabeling your whole file system will change it back to the default. So changecon is only like a temporary thing. Um, you know, if you're like, need to get up and running right away while you investigate why the label's not correct. And then once you figure it out, 
you're going to create a rule permanently um, to say, no, no, that directory should have the data type. Policy problems, like I said, they're, they're pretty broad and cover a lot of cases, but they're not um, necessarily perfect. And if you think you have a situation that would help other users, then uh, open a GitHub issue and, and let us know. Um, especially if you have a fix for it, right? That's even better. <laughs> so general troubleshooting, errors for SE Linux are written here into the audit log. They're identified by the type ABC access vector cache, which is the component in, in uh, the kernel that's enforcing this. Um, AU search lets you search through the audit log to find things. And then lastly, there's an audit to allow tool, which will generate allow rules based on audit failures. So this is an example of an AU search um, command showing an audit log failure. I had to go sort of remove something from the policy to, to generate a failure. What we have is DB2 start denied opening the global registry file, var db2 global.reg. Okay, so it's saying you're not allowed to open it. The source context was running db2d underscore t, okay, that, that is the source, so that was the db2 start domain that it was running in, and this just had a db2 file t type. So it's saying, I could not open that. So that's what you're going to see written out when you run au search. Now this is just sort of a fabricated example, okay. You can also run uh, journal control, which will print out a bit more human readable format of this. So um, the example here is saying SE Linux is preventing this file from read access on this file. So same thing as what was before, just with a few extra words attached to it. And then it's telling you if you think this is allowed, you can run this audit to allow command to create a policy and then load it. So it's telling you right there what you can do if you think that that is a valid scenario. So audit to allow, what we just showed, um, is creating policies. It can create two types, okay? It can create a source file version of the policy that just has the rules as, as code that you can look at, or it can also directly um, create the policy file, the binary file that you immediately load, okay? And that depends on whether it's a little m or a big m as the option for creating the module. Um, I always prefer to first do the little m so you can look and see, you know, exactly what it was doing. Um, and, you know, it's very educational. If you've gone through all of your audit logs and everything and you say, okay, just make it work. I'm on my test system. I know there's nobody doing anything malicious here. Then you can just combine it all in one command to say, hey, a search, give me everything from today and create a rule for that so that it's working. Um, there's a number of packages that you need to install. Uh, I'm not sure if Red Hat has like a big group package for all of these. Um, so they're listed there. You know, these are the yum install and a, and a whole bunch of stuff um, to be able to develop those. You don't need all of them if you've created the PP file and just want to distribute it uh, to systems. But I've always been working on the, the pure code. So um, there are some GUI tools that help you examine what policies you have applied, that you can search through all the policies saying, well, I, I thought that should fail. Why did it work? That, that let you examine rules that say, hey, I'm, I'm looking at this domain. Why did it have right access to this file? So there's a lot of like searching through policies, tools like that. If you want to learn more about SE Linux, um, Red Hat's documentation is really good. Uh, the official GitHub repository has the reference policy that has the basis for a lot of rules. And uh, there's an old SE Linux homepage, but I find it still has a few useful things that weren't moved over to their GitHub page um, to take a look. So the uh, sort of standard boilerplate thing that, you know, some of the stuff about, okay, I'm trying to get it done and, and uh, but not specific releases that we're promising when things are going to happen. But um, that's it. I just wanted to really quickly show you what some of the, the policies looked like. Um, if I switch over here. We're not going to go through this in detail because it would take quite a long time.
Um, but for example, so this is up uh, on GitHub. It's actually still a pull request right now waiting for approval to be <laughs> delivered in, but it's there and you can see it. This is an example of a, an allow rule. Okay, so all of the policies are written as macros and like nested macros and nested macros. So sometimes you've got to do a bit of unwrapping to figure out where you are. But the dollar sign is like an input variable to this macro. And for this case, it's, it's setting up the DB2 administrative domains. Okay, so the engine or the DB2 atom domain. And it's saying, allow this domain to run a get attribute on the file systems labeled with temp file system. So that's exactly what it's, it's, it is. So you can say, allow the DB2 admain, uh, domain to run get attribute on file systems with the temp fs underscore t file type. So it's a bit backwards from the way you want to read it, but that's exactly what an allow rule is. Then you're going to have lots of other macros which bundle up allow rules to kind of make common patterns and make it easier to understand these policies. So this one says manage directory patterns and manage file patterns on that file system. So allowing us to create directories and, and manage, create, delete files from um, things labeled with temp file system, okay? So it, it goes on and on. There's just a lot of different rules that are needed. Um, this is just the same file, different part. These are just, you know, telling SE Linux, these are our types, that these are domains. Um, some of these then, this is a file type, this is an executable file type, and these are all sort of macros that bundle up a bunch of different things again um, into commands. So uh, it's lots of fun reading <laughs> for your flights home. So um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, back to the screen here. Yes. Um, how much performance? Well, it's already in, in, by default, it's already probably there and on. I haven't done one without it, like, so unenforced, but, the right, there's, there's, there's lots of checking for this stuff happening already, so, yeah. Yeah, so any other questions? When I install yes. Files, so, that I think was from the, un, the, the days before really unconfined. So yeah, trying to get that cleaned up. We have made some changes to our SE Linux documentation. Um, so it's absolutely, it, it's not necessary. So by default, you're run, if you were not to run in unconfined, if you were to run in a confined mode, then I might have some concerns. Um, but if you're running unconfined, which is the default, uh, it installs just fine, right? Because you're running unconfined, you basically have access to all um, all files and everything. So, yes, that's not necessary. No with, multiple instances? with multiple instances? No, not really. That's why you want to label each of them. And, and the primary reason is you want, I didn't want to create a, a, a rule that said, oh, label anything in someone's home slash SQL lib directory slash DB2 start is getting into the DB2D domain. Okay? Because if you have multiple instances, once you're in the db2d domain, both instances files will be labeled with the, the, the data type. And technically they could read each other's if they have the file permissions. Now that's where the multi-category security could come into play and you could give them like instance one gets category one and instance two is category two. But none of this is really set up for that. That's a pretty advanced usage. Um, but otherwise, there's no problem. So that's the only caveat is that they'd be able to read each other's files. Um, but other than that, no. But what I, what I didn't want to have is just a, a regular user come along and create a SQL lib directory, create a DB2 start command themselves, just a shell script, and all of a sudden they're running in that domain, right? So that's why you have to have the administrator come in and say, no, no, this is the SQL lib directory and it gets this, uh, these labels applied to it and that's it. No. So, so like I said, discretionary access control rules are followed first. So you still have to have regular file permissions, read and write access to it. Um, this is on top of that. Yep. There's a question here. <coughs> 
Yes. So if it's purely coming in over TCP IP, then it would just be, uh, it wouldn't be an app. The app is more things that are, are you have a user sourcing the DB2 profile and you're trying to um, use that instance. That's where, there, where it would be an app. But if it's purely coming in TCP IP, whether it's local or not, it's likely running unconfined. And then there's rules that say unconfined can open, uh, open ports against DB2. So if they're, using, if they're using shared memory and stuff like CLP and things then, and directly loading our application libraries out of the instance, then it has to be an app. Does, but it's like a separate install, right? Is it? Uh, okay. So if it's loading the DB2 app shared library from the instance, then yes, it would you'd mark it as a, as an app, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the session is C14.